great that InDesign lets you put your panels anywhere you want on your screen, but honestly, if you have too many panels open at the same time, you're going to have no editing frustration. And also, sometimes, let's say you're editing text, you only want your text-relevant panels open. So let's go ahead and put some of these away. I'll put away my swatches panel, and I'll put away my pages and layers panel, and so on, and I'll just get my text-relevant panels open just where I want them. And now, I can save that layout as a workspace. Workspaces save all the information about which panels are open, which are closed, and where the panels live on your screen. So if I go to the window menu, go to workspace, and choose save workspace, InDesign will remember all of that. This one I'm going to call something like text panels. And this is going to remember the locations of all my panels. I'll cover this other option, menu customization, in a later chapter. Now InDesign has saved this workspace, and all I need to do to get back to it is choose text panels anytime I need to. I'll choose default workspace. That's a built-in workspace that always returns me back to the way InDesign was when I first installed it. But next time I'm editing text, it's very easy to choose text panels right out of my workspace submenu, and it comes right back to the way it was. If I later decide I don't need that workspace, it's easy to get rid of. I just choose Delete Workspace out of the Workspace submenu, choose the workspace I want to get rid of, and click Delete. And now it doesn't show up anymore. Workspaces fall into a category that I call Blattner's First Rule of Publishing. Take time now to save even more time later. If you take a little time now to create a bunch of custom workspaces, you're going to save yourself so much time down the line and end up a much happier InDesign user. Fifteen years ago, a lot of people were talking about the term WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. But the word fell out of favor after people started to realize that they really couldn't trust what they saw on screen. But InDesign makes WYSIWYG a reality, because you really can start to trust your monitor again. But you have to know how to manage InDesign's display options. And those display options show up in the View menu. The first one we're going to look at is Guides. If you want to show or hide your margin guides and ruler guides and so on, you can show and hide them from the Grids and Guides submenu. Now I can see the document page and also the bleed guides and the margin guides. I'm going to go to the next page by pressing Shift Page Down, and we can see that here too all our guides are visible. Now these objects are actually bleeding right off the side of the page, and when I print this, it will actually get cropped off at the side of the page. And designers have had to deal with this problem of how to preview bleed objects for years. Well, InDesign makes it simple with a preview mode. The preview mode shows up at the bottom of the tool panel, and we can actually click on this submenu and say, do you want the normal view or the preview mode? Preview mode actually clips off the edge and shows you just what's going to print. All the non-printing objects disappear. Guides disappear, stuff that's off the page is going to disappear, and this gives me a nice, clean view of my page. You can also turn the preview on and off by pressing the W key. InDesign also lets you show or hide the objects on your page itself, that is, the edge of the objects. Here I can see the text frame, but I can't see the edge of the text frame. So I'll go to the View menu and choose Show Frame Edges, and now the edges all appear. I'll go ahead and turn those off and zoom in on this image. If I press Space Command on Mac or Space Control on Windows and zoom in on this area by dragging the marquee, I see something interesting. This vector image, this is an illustrator image, and it looks terrible on my screen. Also, these vector images back here and this raster image, this Photoshop image, looks just too pixelated. What's the problem? The problem is that we're not looking at high quality display. And I can change that by going to the view menu and choosing from the display performance menu, high quality display. This turns on something called display postscript, which ensures that I always get the highest resolution and the highest quality for all my images throughout my document. You can work in the high quality display just as well as typical display, but if you're on a slower machine, it'll slow you down a little bit. There are several other ways to control what you see on screen. For example, if you hit the tab key, it hides all your panels. Tab again and they all come back. Command Option Tab on Mac or Control Option Tab on Windows will show all the side panels, all those docked panels. And press it again, and they turn back into icons again. Knowing what you're looking at is key to being efficient in InDesign and lets you make the right design choices without having to print lots of proofs.
Scientists and artists have long known that looking at something from two or more points of view offers a perspective and understanding that you just can't get any other way. There's even a word for it, parallax. Now, InDesign has a parallax feature, but they call it New Window, and you can find it in the Window menu under the Arrange submenu. Choose New Window, and InDesign creates a new window on the same document. Two windows, one document. Now I'm going to choose from the Window Arrange submenu, Tile Vertically, and that will tell InDesign to arrange my two windows that are open side by side on my screen. What's interesting about New Window and having two different windows on the same document is each window can have its own view. For example, in this view, if I click on this view, I can press W to go into preview mode. And on this window, I can zoom in on just what I'm trying to edit. So I can make really fine-tuned changes here and see the effect from way back here. For example, I'll click on this and shift-click on the back, and I'll just move this around a little bit, and I'll be able to see that the changes I make here are reflected over here as well. There are other ways to use New Window as well. When you're editing long documents, you can have two different parts of a story in the same window. You can have one color managed and the other not. All kinds of options. I find it incredibly helpful to work with two or more windows open, especially when I'm working with a large screen or two monitors. But for some reason, the thing about New Window is you have to force yourself to use it two or three times, or else you just never get around to using it. Force yourself to use it, and after you use it a few times, you'll be hooked. It doesn't matter whether you're building a skyscraper or building an InDesign document. Either way, you need tools to do the work. And you can find all of InDesign's tools over here in the Tool Panel. Let's take a quick tour of our Tool Panel and its tools so that you'll be prepared to use them in the upcoming chapters. The first thing I'm going to show you is how to change the layout of your Tool Panel. This little button up here changes it from a single column to a double column. People who've been using InDesign for a while are probably familiar with a two-column layout, but I like the single column because it saves screen real estate. There's another way to lay this out as well, but you have to take the tool panel out of its dock and drag it onto the window itself, and then when you click on this little double arrow, you can get a single row. Some people like rows that looks more like buttons, more like a Microsoft document or something. I typically, again, like the single column. There's one other trick I want to show you, and that is, I'm going to drag this over, but I'm not going to add it into its own dock. I'm simply going to place it up here next to the edge of the page. And when I do that, I have the ability to add new panels above or below. For example, I might want to grab, let's say, the notes panel, and I'm going to take this over and drag this into the dock over here. Now what this gets me is the ability to have both docked panels and an undocked tool panel in the same column. There's no other way to use the left edge of your screen better than setting it up like this. Okay, let's look at the tools. The first two tools have to do with selecting objects, either the entire object or just one part of an object with the direct select tool. The next set of tools have to do with creating objects. The Bezier Pen tool lets you draw any kind of shape on your page, as long as you can draw with a Bezier Pen. I'm not so good at the drawing, so I usually skip that one. The Type tool lets you both edit text and type text, but it also lets you create text frames, and we'll be seeing that in much more detail in another chapter. The Pencil tool is great for just drawing freehand, but again, you have to be able to draw. Better to use a Wacom tablet if you're going to be using something like that. The line tool is great for just drawing straight lines, vertical, diagonal, horizontal, something like that. Terrific for that. Now the next set of tools have to do with drawing rectangular frames, and we're going to be seeing in a later chapter how you can add text and graphics into frames. And the funny thing about InDesign is that there's two sets of rectangular frame tools, and both of these just make frames. This one puts an X in it, which technically is a graphic frame, and this one makes a regular frame. Let's say I'll just draw out a rectangle here. We don't see an X back there because it's simply a frame with a one-point rule around it. That's all it does. This is more if you just want to draw a shape. But honestly, both of these just make frames, and both of them work the same way. You can put text in them or graphics in them. It doesn't really matter. And again, we're going to be covering importing graphics and text in a later chapter. Now, one thing that you may have noticed is some of these tools have this little black triangle in the lower right corner. That means there's hidden tools underneath this tool. So if we click and hold for a moment, we'll see those tools. We can see that there's a rectangular frame tool, an elliptical frame tool, and a polygon frame tool. They're all hiding underneath there. 
By the way, if you're in a hurry, you don't have to click and wait. Instead, all you have to do to get those hidden ones is click and move the mouse. They just pop up immediately. Again, here we've got rectangular tools, the elliptical tool, and the polygon tool. And any of them work, they all just make frames. The next tool down is the button tool, which is appropriate if you're doing interactive PDFs out of InDesign, like a PDF that has movies and sounds and buttons. All of those things are possible with InDesign, but that's an advanced topic and it's outside the scope of this essential training title. The scissors tool actually lets me cut an object as though I had a pair of scissors. For example, I can select that tool and click right here on the shape, and now I have cut the rectangle into a path. The rotation tool, the scale tool, uh, these are all tools that have to do with transforming objects, and I'm going to cover transforming objects like rotating and scaling, skewing, in a later chapter. Then we've got the gradient tool, and underneath the gradient tool is a gradient feather tool, which is new in CS3, and these tools let me change and blur the edges of objects or the interiors of objects. The free transform tool combines many of the other tools like rotating and scaling all in one single tool. The note tool lets you add notes to your InDesign document so that other people in your work group can see those notes and if necessary act on them. The eyedropper tool is a wonderful tool for copying formatting from one object and putting it someplace else. And I've got a whole movie on that later on in this title which gives you a lot of power. This is a very, very powerful little tool. And the hand tool, we talked about in an earlier movie, lets you scroll around your document, pan from one place on your page to another. And the zoom tool is, of course, for zooming in and out. Now, there are other features down here at the bottom of the tool panel which are really helpful, but they're not actually tools. I'm not sure why they stuck them in here. They're not really tools. They're just ways to adjust things in your document. For example, these icons let you control the stroke or the fill of whatever is selected on the page. So in this case, the stroke is on top, so if I change the color, it will change the color of the stroke. If I click on the fill, then that icon moves to the front, and if I change the color, it'll change the fill of whatever selected. These items down here also let me control applying colors to whatever selected on my page, and the preview, which we talked about in an earlier movie, having to do with what we see on screen. For example, if I change to the preview mode, we can see that everything that's not going to print gets cut out. Now, the object is still currently selected on my page, so it still appears selected. But if I deselect that by clicking off here in the gray area, we can see that it just gets clipped right off. It's still there, but the preview mode won't show it. Now, to me, the coolest part of the tool panel is that you can still use all of these tools and all of these features even if you close it. If you go to the window menu and choose tools, the tool panel appears. But you can still use all those features by using the equivalent keyboard shortcuts. And in the next movie, we'll not only explore all these keyboard shortcuts, but even look at how to make your own.